you know, once in a great while, there comes among us a man who everyone learns to respect, to admire, indeed to love. But enough about me. I have to introduce our speaker. <laughs> I've been dying to do that for 20 years. <laughs> for 17 years in Washington, I had the great honor and privilege of introducing our speaker today to n numerous audiences, indeed, around the world. And I was always restricted by protocol to introducing as follows, ladies and gentlemen, the Chief Justice of the United States, and sit down. One never uses the last name of the, the Chief Justice who is in office. There's only one. No reason to use a name. So protocol requires that, as with the President, one says, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, and that's it. You don't praise him or anything like that. He's not running for anything. <laughs> uh, but I never had a chance to say anything more. Now I do, and I could go for at least three hours. I don't intend to, so I won't scare you any further, uh, because I couldn't do justice anyway. We have with us this afternoon the 15th Chief Justice of the United States of America, 15th. And if uh, Mr. Rutledge uh, was really counted, uh, uh, overcounted, was not overcounted, our speaker would be the 14th Chief Justice of the United States. Uh, I can say very quickly, because I was there and saw it, uh, in his 17 years, from 1969 to 1986, as the Chief Justice, uh, the federal judiciary saw its greatest growth by far, an exponential growth, from some 240 judges to some 890 judges. And of course, all the rest of the federal judiciary uh, and all the uh, clerks and probation officers and public defenders and all the rest of it uh, grew accordingly. So in the midst of that tremendous growth, uh, our speaker's administrative abilities came to the fore. Uh, I counted, and probably others more scholarly might count more, but I counted and saw up front 79 specific innovations in the federal judiciary in the third branch of government, while our speaker headed that branch of government, 79. Not just innovations that happened during that time, but came from him and were organized and promoted, and uh, people were encouraged to step in and get the job done. One of the great honors, among many, of being dean of John Marshall Law School is to introduce someone like our speaker today. It is my honor and privilege to present to you the 15th Chief Justice of the United States, the Honorable Warren E. Berger. Dean Markey, I should say now. The honor, the honor is mine to be <clears throat> invited to speak at the law school named for the great Chief Justice, as we know in the law among judges, lawyers, and even among some political scientists. When we speak of the great Chief Justice, we don't have to say John Marshall. Uh, beyond doubt, uh, uh, the greatest of greats and the greatest of greats among the founding fathers, in my judgment. I wrote an introduction to a new edition of Leonard Baker's Life of John Marshall recently, and I said I, in that introduction, I said I would rank the founding fathers, uh, James Madison, John Marshall, and I think I'd give Jefferson third, maybe fourth. But John Marshall and James Madison come uh, ahead of him. And now we meet today at a time when the nation has just witnessed some hardball politics. 
And maybe some of you have watched television on that from time to time. <laughs> I must say that when I was up for confirmation, that is now more than 20 years ago, in May of 1969, it, it, it was over so quickly they didn't have time to set up any cameras. The hearing lasted about 40 minutes, and there was only one question uh, that had to do with uh, some future legal question, and uh, I haven't read the transcript. Uh, in fact, I don't think I've ever read it, but I can remember what my answer was. Uh, uh, Senator, that that's a question that may well come before the court, and it would be entirely inappropriate for me to give any indication of how I would decide the question. And uh, at lunch today, meeting with some very distinguished members of the bench and bar here, you know, we naturally turn to the recent confirmation process and the hardball politics aspect of it, and I express my view that the only questions the only questions uh, proper uh, for uh, a person before that committee for confirmation are questions relating first to his or her integrity. Uh, I think it would be appropriate if a man had anything to go on to say, have you ever been convicted of a felony? And, uh, but he'd better not ask that unless <laughs> the answer is yes. Uh, questions on integrity, legal education, legal experience, and judicial experience. And uh, that's all. No question even bordering, let alone focusing specifically on uh, how you would decide, how you would vote on a future question. As a matter of fact, my own experience after 23 years of very active practice before I went on the bench, that some of my views, which were vague and general on some constitutional subjects, uh, underwent a change. And I remember when I think I answered the question that day that uh, when I uh, read the briefs, read the record, heard the argument, sat in a conference with my colleagues and heard what they had to say, then I will be able to answer the question you've just put to me. So I thought, against this background of the recent events, it would be possibly of some interest to talk about the fact, remind all of us, ourselves, including me, that uh, hardball politics relating to the judiciary didn't begin just in the last two or three months. I go back to well, not quite 200 years ago. 1801 is when it really began. That was when John Marshall took office. He was confirmed readily uh, by uh, a, a more or less lame duck Senate that consisted, as we know, largely of uh, Federalists. We didn't have parties in those days as clearly defined as we have now. But uh, it began soon, Rutledge, to whom Judge uh, Markey referred, Dean Markey, excuse me, uh, uh, Rutledge was rejected after he held office for five or six months uh, under a recess appointment. Well, one of the reasons he was rejected was because he'd been very critical of the Jay Treaty. The Chief Justice in those days didn't have enough to do, and the President sent him off to negotiate treaties and things like that. And uh, he was critical of it, and a great many people in the United States were very critical of it because uh, they thought he had given away too much to the British uh, in terms of trying to settle the formalities and details of the peace. Very soon, Jefferson's own mixed feelings, I think that's the most favorable way, uh, mixed feelings about judicial independence uh, began to come out. Uh, William Branch Childs, a House member from Virginia and later a senator from Virginia, had said very frankly that uh, 
These offices, the judicial appointments, belong to us, the new Jeffersonian Anti-Federalist Party, later to become known as the Republican Party of that day. And uh, there wasn't any doubt about it. They wanted to lay the foundations for it. So the first thing they did was pick out the most vulnerable federal judge in the United States. And there were only 13 district judges beside the members of the Supreme Court. And there wasn't anything wrong with him, except that he hadn't been at court for a couple of years. And today, I think he'd be diagnosed as having Alzheimer's disease and alcohol uh, addiction. Uh, so it was easy to make the case. Uh, this was Judge Pickering, John Pickering. And uh, you'll remember, if you looked at it recently, he did not even appear, did not have a counsel. The House he voted the impeachment in the morning, and the Senate uh, conducted the trial, if it can be called that, in the afternoon, and he was removed from office. I think historians of that day, of viewing that day, who say that the purpose of that process was to get the public uh, adjusted to the idea of removing a federal judge. The, they weren't used to the idea. People who didn't grasp the concept of what we call life tenure uh, uh, positions in the federal government. And there was that underlying existing fear of a strong national government. Then, as part of this long-range plan, and it was a plan uh, conceived by these gentlemen in Virginia, uh, they brought an impeachment against uh, Justice Samuel Chase of Maryland. You remember him, too. He was an excellent judge in a purely legal sense, but he uh, wasn't very much on judicial temperament, and particularly when he was riding circuit, trying cases as a trial judge or sitting on the ad hoc uh, courts of appeal. Uh, he was not a very good judge. He was his bias against the uh, Jeffersonian anti-federalists, uh, lawyers, and a bias in favor of the others uh, was quite obvious. But this man had been uh, a member of uh, the Continental Congress. <clears throat> I think, as I recall, he had been one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. He'd been a prominent figure and unquestionably an able lawyer. But he was the second one. <clears throat> the ultimate target was John Marshall. And John Marshall knew it. <clears throat> Everybody in the bar knew it. And uh, that's why it was a very great spectacle. If there had been television in that day, uh, uh, that would have been a real show. Uh, uh, Samuel Chase had some of the best lawyers in America who came to represent them because they saw this as an attack on judicial independence. And they were concerned about it. That trial went along for quite a while. John Marshall himself was called as a witness for him. And it's the only instance in the entire career of the great Chief Justice that anyone can suggest that there was any weakness on his part. He and his brother James both testified, and his own brother scolded him afterward for the weakness of his testimony. When they put questions to John Marshall about Chase's conduct on circuit, he would say, uh, that's a speculative question, that's a hypothetical question, I wasn't there. I don't know what happened. I can't answer that. Uh, and uh, relating to that same and the only dark spot, and it isn't a very dark one, a little gray spot on John Marshall's entire career, is that he wrote a letter to someone some weeks or months later saying perhaps uh, we should consider the idea of having Congress have the authority to review and overrule the Supreme Court. Uh, on a constitutional question. And of course, uh, John Marshall never pursued that, and of course his whole career is a rejection of it. Uh, in Marbury against Madison, perhaps John Marshall 
and to show you I'm not completely addicted to only favorable things about John Marshall. Uh, uh, a couple of uh, years uh, uh, later, he uh, expressed more views uh, along that uh, line. Uh, and in Marbury against Madison, I puzzle over it every time I look at the opinion. I think it's 5,500 or 6,000 words. Uh, Marbury against Madison could have been written as a per curiam opinion. I don't need the whole napkin that much. The per curiam would say, the only question before the court in this case is whether this court has jurisdiction to entertain uh, an original action uh, by a plaintiff who claims he has been injured by an unlawful, un unconstitutional act, uh, and then turn to what it was uh, in light of uh, Section 13 of the Judiciary Act of 1789, uh, which had been drafted largely by the Chief Justice who uh, had one of the Chief Justices, uh, Ellsworth, who had preceded Marshall. And then he would say, no, the only original actions that are permitted by the Constitution are listed in Article 3, and they are actions between two states and actions involving foreign uh, diplomats. And there are no others, and so Section 13 of the uh, Judiciary Act of 1789 is uh, invalid, period, uh, case dismissed. And then, parenthetically, uh, uh, Mr. Marbury would have had, if the statute hadn't run on him, uh, the right to, to go into the district court and pursue his remedies there. But then Marshall went on for all these pages. And the way I have justified it in my own mind was that this was Marshall the teacher. It was time, uh, because of there being no background, uh, to get the story before the American people. Now, part of that story was an extremely sharp scolding of the people who had sponsored this. He didn't mention Jefferson's name or uh, Senator Child's name, but it was perfectly clear that he was talking about Thomas Jefferson and, and uh, the other anti-federalists. And uh, perhaps in that day, functioning as Marshall, the teacher, of constitutional law, uh, that was justified. Um, but then on top of everything, he didn't cite one case that he himself had argued, the only one he ever argued in the Supreme Court, where against Hilton in uh, 1796. And the court at that time, with an opinion written by this very judge who was a uh, justice who was impeached, uh, Samuel Chase, decided that uh, a statute of the state of Virginia that had been sponsored uh, at the beginning of the war, sometime after uh, the declaration, while Thomas Jefferson was governor, to work out an arrangement to pay debts of the Virginia debtors to uh, British creditors, provided that the money could be paid at any time into that fund, and then it would be when the peace treaty was uh, uh, settled, uh, the debts would be paid. And part of the objection to the Jay Treaty was that it required that all the debts of American debtors to British creditors be paid in sterling, which would be much like today saying in gold. Uh, the court decided unanimously uh, against John Marshall that uh, since a treaty of the United States stood on the same footing as other provisions of the Constitution, uh, a state statute contrary was invalid. I would have thought, and in that uh, per curiam that I uh, mentioned, I think uh, I would have uh, said C, at least, C where against Hilton, uh, 
whatever volume it was, 1796. Now John Marshall's argument to show that he was not a hypocrite by any means, John Marshall's argument in that case was not to that direct point. All he argued was that the debts were incurred before the, the revolution, before the Constitution, and therefore uh, they were beyond the reach of a subsequent treaty. Pretty good argument too, but it was rejected by the court. So John Marshall had the subject of Marbury against Madison in mind, uh, the basic subject, long before the case came up for argument. Now this attitude on the part of the anti-federalists uh, continued. And so I'll jump over some intervening events in the interest of time and go to 1806. <clears throat> you remember that uh, in Jefferson's first election, he won the election uh, not in the Electoral College, but in the House of Representatives. Uh, there was no majority for either of the top uh, front runners. Uh, in the Electoral College, and so it had to go to the House. Jefferson and uh, Aaron Burr were the two. And you remember, we've changed the Constitution since then, but at that time, the, the, the runner-up was Vice President. Fairly sensible idea before there were any political parties. Uh, so, it went into the House, and on the 36th ballot, by one vote, Jefferson was elected over uh, Burr. Uh, the feelings at that time, even among uh, George Washington's group, that is the Federalist group, were very mixed. Alexander Hamilton, who was later killed by Aaron Burr, Alexander Hamilton wrote a letter to John Marshall and to many other people saying of the choice between Jefferson and Burr, as bad as that choice is, uh, the less evil choice is Jefferson, and therefore do what you can to support him. There's no record that Marshall ever did anything about it. But it suggests something about the intensity of the feeling at that time. Uh, so here was, uh, in 1806, uh, Jefferson in his second term, uh, uh, in his first term, by the way, it was Aaron Burr who presided over the impeachment trial of uh, uh, Justice Chase. And uh, although he'd been completely ignored by the Jeffersonian group up to that time, suddenly uh, he was uh, courted by them and uh, uh, friends and relatives were appointed to various positions, but uh, probably one of the good things about Aaron Burr in his life of a very mixed career was that he tried that impeachment as impartially and fairly as any presiding judge could possibly do it. And presiding over the United States Senate, as we discovered in the last uh, couple of weeks, is not an easy thing to do. But now it jumps to the period of the second term. Uh, Jefferson didn't want uh, Burr as his vice president, and probably Burr didn't want to have any more to do with it. And um, Burr was engaged in a lot of curious activities. He went around Europe uh, ostensibly to stimulate investment in the Western development of the United States, but probably something beyond that. There's a book out, uh, How Authentic, no one really knows, uh, Napoleon's dossier on uh, Aaron Burr. Uh, Napoleon refused to see him, and the, no chief of state in Europe, Western Europe, uh, saw him, but uh, Burr saw a lot of uh, underlings. Then Burr came back to the United States, and he was pressing for development of the West, and this would make a great movie sometime. Uh, he had gathered uh, down on, uh, on the way uh, down below Pittsburgh on uh, the river in what is now West Virginia, about a hundred men and supplies on flatboats, 
and the, Jefferson suspected that he was going to try to develop a war with Mexico and declare himself an emperor of some new area. Maybe he was. No one will ever know for certain. At any rate, Jefferson had ordered General Wilkinson, the military commander of the West, to uh, make reports and check on him. A curious thing that developed about General Wilkinson was that if Burr was going to go anywhere, uh, he wanted to be on the right side uh, with Burr and uh, with Jefferson. Jefferson uh, sent messages to Congress saying, in effect, Aaron Burr is a traitor who should be hanged. And they went into one state and tried to get an indictment. The grand jury wouldn't indict. They went to another one. The grand jury wouldn't, would not indict. Then they arrested Burr and brought him back in chains to Richmond, Virginia. And John Marshall, you remember in the days of the circuit riding, was as I was 200 years later, uh, circuit justice for the Fourth Circuit. And, uh, however, I didn't have to go down and sit on the Court of Appeals or try cases. In that day, as the Chief Justice did. He could have avoided that. Uh, again, no one knows, but perhaps he thought that the district judge, however experienced, could not stand up to the President of the United States who was determined to get a conviction of Burr. And uh, these reports, uh, messages to Congress, and in a, what we would call today press releases, occupy 60 or 70 pages in one of the uh, history books of that period. Uh, constant statements by Jefferson about treason and uh, Treason being treason of uh, Aaron Burr. Uh, Marshall, of course, says the trial judge uh, presided over the grand jury, and they had the devil's own time trying to get grand jurors who were not uh, uh, biased, because uh, the newspapers had picked up all of these things that Jefferson was issuing it, and. Uh, while I, I hate to put the two names together, the fact is uh, the conduct of the late unlimited Senator Joseph McCarthy is modest, modest compared with the things Jefferson did with respect to Burr before he was indicted. Uh, they did finally get a grand jury that was acceptable. The grand jury did indict, and there's no indication in the record, and the record is very complete. Marshall saw to that, uh, that uh, uh, very complete in the sense that he didn't do anything to stop an indictment. Then they came to pick a jury and they had even a more difficult time, but they did get a jury. And the big battle uh, was then joined and Burr, who was himself a superb lawyer, as we know, had some of the outstanding lawyers in America representing him on the defense side. And I, a couple of times, I've gone down to Richmond. I've sat in the courtroom where this case was tried, tried to uh, visualize uh, uh, what happened. Uh, Burr insisted that General uh, Wilkinson be brought in. Uh, they, Jefferson and his people resisted that, but. Uh, he finally was brought in and he was destroyed on cross-examination as a totally unreliable uh, witness. Then Burr asked, on a subpoena deuces tecum, for all the reports that Wilkins, General Wilkinson had filed, and Jefferson resisted that, said they can't do that to the President of the United States. Another President, 200 years later, uh, said something the same thing. But uh, he finally said, the U.S. Attorney and the Attorney General told him he, he had no protection. He finally sent some things in, a uh, purported copy of the indictment of the reports, with a lot of what today we would call asterisks. And uh, when Marshall wanted to know what are these little things, he was told those were deletions. By whom? By the President. Why? In the interest, in the national interest. So Marshall said, send it back to him. I want everything, and I'll decide in camera 
uh, whether there is anything in the national interest to be protected. They didn't call it national security then. At any rate, by that time, Burr, having milked it for all it was worth, uh, dropped the point. But Marshall's opinion was one of the principal factors in the case I mentioned of the later president as to the power of a court to secure even uh, matters of executive privilege uh, if it was in the interest of the administration of justice. Of course, Burr had a stronger case because it was the defense who was trying to get the information. Uh, but the court, as you know, in 1973 held that the president had to submit all of the papers, that this was in the interest of the fair administration of justice. Now, why is any of this important in relation to the recent events? Uh, well, one of them is that hardball politics in relation to the judiciary didn't just begin recently. Uh, it uh, began a long time ago. And then you look back over the years to the number of uh, confirmation hearings which have rejected nominees by the president, sometimes uh, properly so, and sometimes, at least in my view, improperly. I was in law school when John J. Parker, uh, for the Fourth Circuit, uh, judge before whom I later argued some cases, uh, was up and he lost, I think, by one or two votes. Uh, the grounds were entirely spurious, and the senator, a uh, maverick Republican senator from Nebraska, a Republican, bear in mind, uh, rejecting, leading the rejection of a nominee of a Republican president, later confessed that he was mistaken and if he had it to do over, he would not have objected to John Parker. Then that happened again when Clement Hainsworth of the Fourth Circuit was nominated in 1970 after I was on the court. And similarly, that rejection was unwarranted. Uh, this man, Hainsworth, like Parker, was a superbly qualified uh, uh, judge and would have made a splendid member of the court. Then it was repeated with uh, Judge Robert Bork. Uh, is that bad? Uh, someone asked me, uh, and one meeting shortly after the Bork hearings, and this was an off-the-record session, no reporters present, uh, should, said the questioner, uh, not a student, uh, a leading business executive who was angry about the Bork rejection, said, shouldn't that the Constitution be amended to take that power away from the Senate? And uh, I said, no, no. Uh, the very idea of separation of powers carries with it the idea that each of the constituencies and the participants in this separation of powers uh, are made up of human beings and they're going to make some mistakes. And because the power of the confirmation is abused uh, sometimes, is not a reason to take that power away. Uh, this is part of the functioning of a democratic system part of the checks and balances, sometimes too much check and not enough balance. But uh, that's the way it ought to uh, work. I repeat that when you look at the record of the trial of Aaron Burr, laying aside the fact that he had this very checkered career, uh, or passing on his guilt or innocence, laying that aside, the idea of the President of the United States condemning him in advance in public statements uh, with the prestige of the presidency behind him was an extraordinary thing. And uh, while it's a gray spot, maybe a black spot on Thomas Jefferson's life and career, it does not change the fact that he was a great American and that belongs in high on the list of our founding fathers. But it also, as over the years, uh, come through to me that John Marshall was the one who in all these great crises, Marbury against Madison, a couple of years later, fighting against uh, uh, Jefferson 
again in McCulloch against Maryland, and then uh, Gibbons against Ogden, the steamboat case, and others. Uh, John Marshall, more than any single one of our founding fathers, if we can include him there, uh, set the building blocks that have guided this country for 200 years. And that emerges now as we've watched what's happened in uh, the Soviet Union and in all of the Eastern satellite countries where the idea of judicial independence uh, is simply an unknown. I've had over the last five years as chairman of the Bicentennial Commission a parade, a stream of the European judges and lawyers and law professors visiting this country to see how our system works. And almost invariably, it doesn't make any difference what country. Uh, they come back after about a half hour or 45 minutes of discussion. Uh, tell us again about this separation of powers, uh, the checks and balances. It, it, they can't see it. And I've said constantly, uh, we don't claim we have a tidy or orderly system. If you want a really tidy or orderly system where things just work mechanically, then you have something as Adolf Hitler had in Germany for a while. Uh, the, the decision was made and it was executed. And with it, a lot of other human beings were executed. And to the same extent, if not more, in the Soviet Union, this was true uh, after the revolution of 1917. These are things we need to think about uh, as we now move in a matter of uh, weeks only to the 200th anniversary of the ratification of the Bill of Rights. Uh, with all its confusion, with all its untidiness, it's now more clear than it has ever been, at least to me, uh, that we have uh, a great system. And I am not, not discouraged by the recent events. I was offended by some of the events in the hearings on uh, Judge Thomas, but, and I hope they'll change the process, uh, or at least uh, clean it up so you're not trying a human being uh, on hearsay. Uh, but uh, it, it will continue, and uh, I think it's clear that no other system in the world has uh, anything to compare with it. And we should uh, take pride in it, take part in it, and see that it's made to work. Uh, Judge Markey had said to me that he would like to have some dialogue, Q&A, and uh, uh, if he says I'm going to answer the questions, that's a mistake. <laughs> I will address the questions. I don't guarantee to answer. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, in the interest of time, I had cut the introduction short, as you know, and one thing I neglected to mention was that the Chief Justice went from the center seat of the court to the center seat of the United States Commission on the Bicentennial of the Constitution and Bill of Rights, uh, where he's been operating 20 hours a day ever since. Uh, I mentioned to him at lunch that the uh, our school was putting on on November 1st under the leadership of uh, Professor uh, Kendall, Walter Kendall, and Michael Singh, a program on the Bill of Rights for which, unfortunately, the chief can't stay. But I'm reminded that when he first took over the chairmanship of the commission, he said that the commission's role was to provide to the people of the United States a history lesson on the Constitution. 
He is, as you obviously noted, a lover of the Constitution in the truest sense, uh, not because he was born on the same day, because it's not exactly the same day, but it's September 17th. The date of the birth date of the Constitution of the United States is also the birth date of Chief Justice Berger. So we've now had a history. We've had a history lesson. I wouldn't say it. We've had a history lesson here today for which, Mr. Chief Justice, we're very grateful. Now, fire away. Questions. I didn't say answers. Questions. Professor Pallel? Why did the Bank of the Armstrong not seek a constitutional amendment overriding Marbury versus Why do you think that Jefferson didn't seek a constitutional amendment to overcome the 11th? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know, but by the time you got through with the uh, Chase impeachment, uh, Justice Chase, the only justice ever on whom an impeachment uh, conviction was sought, I think he saw that the leaders of the profession uh, did accept the idea of uh, judicial independence. And uh, as a matter of fact, there are many writings and statements of Thomas Jefferson in which he agreed that the judiciary must be independent. But when they crossed him up, he had a different view of the matter. Uh, this is one uh, that uh, has eluded the historians, as you probably well know, uh, for many, uh, many years. Uh, I wish I knew. But I think he decided uh, that it wouldn't work. You remember one other thing. Uh, he quietly and somewhat secretly supported the idea of the, the, of the power of a state to secede from the Union. And that wasn't as much of a treasonous idea in that day as it is now. If they voluntarily came in, why couldn't they voluntarily get out? Uh, marriage was a little more stable in those days than it is uh, uh, now, but uh, uh, others answered that by saying, well, this is like a marriage. It's easy to get in, but in that day, very hard to get out. <laughs> Anyone else with a question? You all know everything there is to know about Marbury versus Madison, as the professor saying? I'd like to ask a question. Uh, you already referred to one of the most famous decisions in your term about the United States versus Nixon. Uh, and I've heard stories that uh, Justice Earl Warren was officially uh, followed in the apportionment decisions during his term. And I wondered if there was one decision during your term as Chief Justice that you were especially following. Uh, I've had that question. I've had that question put to me before. I. I find it a difficult one to answer. There are many, many cases that the public doesn't hear much about at all that are terribly important. Uh, uh, one example is what came to be known as the snail darter case, uh, uh, TVA against uh, Hill, where the Congress had passed a statute which in its application produced an absolutely absurd result that after the additional TVA dam was created at a cost of well over $100 million, uh, somebody, uh, environmentalists who've done some great things for the country, got in and had uncontradicted evidence that uh, uh, the snail darter, a fish nobody had heard of before except a few fish experts, a fish about that long, uh, could live only in that one little pool that was going to be destroyed by the backup water of the dam. On that uncontradicted evidence, uh, uh, the courts, district court and on up through the courts of appeals, had said, that's it. Came to our court, and it was a split decision to my surprise. Uh, the majority opinion uh, had to go to the point of saying, there is nothing in the Constitution that forbids Congress from doing foolish things, not quite in those words. Uh, and uh, the, the, the question is whether there is anything in this act which is contrary to the Constitution. The dissenting, the primary dissenting opinion uh, said, but after all, we, the Supreme Court, have an obligation to 
use common sense to protect the common wheel. The majority opinion said, in effect, no, no. Uh, the obligation of this court is just to see if the act of Congress violates the Constitution. If it doesn't, that's the end of it. Uh, we are not the monitors and reviewers of the wisdom of uh, legislative action. Uh, that's a case that hasn't had much attention except from a few uh, people in the law schools uh, who are deeply concerned, as we should all be, about separation of powers. Uh, we've had more cases on separation of powers during my 17 years at the court than in all the previous uh, years. Uh, this is part of the aggressiveness of each of the three branches, Congress reaching out, trying to take over functions that belong to the president and sometimes functions that belong to the courts. The Boucher case, uh, two of them, uh, are examples of that, uh, where uh, they were having uh, legislative officials performing executive and judicial acts. That's something that's got to be watched. And uh, these hearings, again, going back to the hearings on Judge Thomas, have some of that. Uh, the question, uh, what does advice and consent mean? What is the scope of the inquiry? Uh, now I read uh, commentators saying that the Senate is going to redefine the whole function. They've not only got to redefine it, but then they've got to follow their redefinition. Uh, and uh, that's not going to be easy. But I don't condemn the Senate committee as vigorously as some others do. Uh, in fact, I wouldn't use the word condemn. I would, I would criticize, uh, uh, but not condemn. Any other question? Should she? Yes. Perfect. Recently, I met a special interest group found the Constitution and their cause for some kind of union to, for example, like supporters and break the way people. What is your opinion of amending the Constitution of the Union special interest? You want to repeat it so that they can hear in the back. Okay, so everyone could hear in the back. Now, what is the Chief Justice's opinion about amending the Constitution by at the behest of, quote, special interest groups, or what was the other, through the Congress? Well, the flag case. The flag case, yeah. Well, the flag case question was one of them that came to me. That's part of your question. It came to me on an embarrassing situation. We were on the, over on the White House lawn. One of our major contests and programs in the Bicentennial was a pictorial historical map contest for students in the schools. We furnished them with a blank uh, map, about as big as the top of this uh, lectern, uh, nothing on it except the map of the United States from the Mississippi River East. The only labels were British Canada, Spanish Florida, and the outlines of the 13 states. And then the fourth, fifth, and sixth grades had a contest, and the seventh, eighth, and ninth in the high schools. The whole class did these things. And uh, that isn't part of the question, but they were, it was just magnificent work done by these kids. And the winners at the three levels were brought to Washington with their parents and their school teachers, and Barbara Bush agreed to present the awards. This was right about the time. Uh, this was the second year we did it, right about the time of the flag burning case. And the reporters shouldn't be doing it. But they asked her what she thought about the flag burning. And she said, I think the same as my husband thinks, and you know what that is. Then they asked me. And I said, I'm not going to wrap myself in the flag because I'm afraid I might get burned. And, uh, Barbara Bush, for a minute or two, wasn't sure if she liked that. She's, uh, there was a possible implication that I was criticizing the president, which, which was not there. Uh, but uh, my answer now to the substantive part of it is, and later I did, even on a public occasion, I said a constitutional convention is a matter of such grave importance that I would not call a constitutional convention to deal with a problem uh, that's raised by a handful of emotionally and perhaps mentally uh, maladjusted people who find no other way to express their ideas. 
I think that put me on both sides of the question again. <laughs> but I, I would not call a convention for that purpose, because if you call a convention, there's no way of limiting them to the subject of the call. Uh, the original constitutional convention, which of course wasn't a constitutional convention at all, uh, came after the Mount Vernon Conference, as it was called, the Annapolis Conference, and uh, then the, the Confederation Congress sent the, this out to the states uh, to call a meeting to, for the sole and express purpose, that's the language of the call, for the sole and express purpose of revising the Articles of Confederation. The word constitution doesn't appear in the call. The, the, the delegates paid no attention to the limitation on the call, and happily they didn't. And we produ they produced a constitution, and there were objections to it on that uh, uh, ground. As a matter of fact, when it went back to the Congress, the Confederation Congress, there were uh, proposals made to censure the 55 delegates for doing something they weren't supposed to do for exceeding their authority. So I'd be very wary of the Constitutional Convention because then every special interest group in the country that has some idea, maybe a good one, maybe a silly one, would be in there uh, trying to reshape the whole Constitution. It's done pretty well for 200 years. No other one in all history has done it. I'd leave it the way it is right now. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. I think in Miracle in Philadelphia, it was pointed out that so many delegates were instructed not to even talk about the Constitution, uh, which brings me to my final thought. As you were speaking, and speaking of our government and its problems and how it's still a good one, etc., I was reminded of something I've said so often and others have. We must have the best form of government in the world. Otherwise, it couldn't take the beating we give it all the time. Thank you all for coming. We'll see some of you at the reception. Pardon? Well, I think it's getting pretty late for some. I don't know. Is it, I didn't detect any other questions. Well, there's questions. Yes, of course. Your, uh, top three, uh, of the various Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chief Justice, top three, of which you mean? What are you talking about? The top three founders? Would you explain? Oh, I they, take the top three founders. Madison first, the architect of the Constitution, a quiet little fellow, only five foot six, I think, not a good speaker, but an extraordinary brain. Uh, not only was the architect laying out the basic plan and keeping the delegates focusing on it, uh, but then he overcame his own objections to a Bill of Rights. and. Uh, in the first Congress, as a member of Congress from Virginia, proposed the Bill of Rights. He proposed 12 amendments, two of which the Congress rejected because one of them said they couldn't raise their pay uh, while they were in session. It could only be raised by uh, if it was effective in a future uh, term. And the other had another relatively unimportant subject. Uh, and I put John Marshall second because he made it work. Uh, the concept uh, of, of uh, Marbury against Madison was really widely accepted by lawyers of that day. Uh, and Marshall, at age 33, attending the ratification convention, you know, when the Constitution came to Virginia for ratification, in a debate with Patrick Henry, who has said this Constitution, among other flaws, gives too much power to the judiciary too much unreviewable power. Uh, young John Marshall, 33, answered Patrick Henry saying, if the Congress or the President passes some act interfering with your rights, where will you turn? Where will you turn if you haven't got an independent court to say they're wrong? And that question, where will you turn, has guided this country for, for 200 years now although the court is frequently criticized by members of Congress when we find an act unconstitutional. Uh, it is widely accepted by the public uh, and by the Congress uh, itself. One of the unfortunate things is that many historians and political scientists have commented on this, that it has made Congress less responsible 
uh, one president wants you to send legislation over and say that it's not your business, Congress business, to worry about the constitutionality if this thing passed. Uh, so Congress doesn't consider, uh, sometimes doesn't act responsibly uh, on those questions. And who will watch the watchman? Who will review the Supreme Court? Uh, Chief Justice Stone and a footnote in one opinion. The students here will remember that, I think, even if the faculty doesn't. Uh, uh, said the, the one thing that governs and controls us is our own consciences. And I have watched, uh, when I came to the court, the senior justice was Hugo Black and Bill Douglas, uh, Bill Brennan, and uh, Thurgood Marshall. Uh, these men all had firm ideas uh, about certain things. And other justices had uh, firm ideas that were not quite in the same uh, along the same lines. Uh, I can say after 17 years and five months watching these men work and frequently disagreeing that I have never seen anything except uh, an act of conscience on the part, a sincere belief, uh, including on many occasions uh, voting in a way that they wish they didn't have to vote. Uh, with students particularly when I'm at colleges, I've been asked, have you ever voted against something uh, on a case uh, that you, that you uh, didn't agree with? And I said, yes, frequently, uh, frequently. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Constitution it should be the focus of every judge and every justice, not just justices of the Supreme Court. And my observation of the judges of this country, state and federal, and all the members of the Supreme Court is, that's just what they do. And, and that's why the system has worked. That doesn't mean they were always right. Uh, the Dred Scott case, uh, to read it is enough to make a person in our age ill. That was 1857. Bad enough then, just think of it, in 1896, Plessy against Ferguson came along, the Civil War amendments were in the Constitution, and uh, they said separate was all right if it was equal. Uh, over the great, uh, a single dissent, uh, the earlier John Marshall Harlan, uh, that's, uh, that reminds me, as I, as I look at it and think about it, that the Constitutional Convention was barely a, a hundred years after the last witch burning in New England, in Massachusetts. Just think of that change, burning witches, and a hundred years later, we have an, another great step forward. <clears throat> and then we have some slippage in 1857 and in 1896. And, uh, those are the things we need to be thinking about uh, in terms of the Bill of Rights. Sometimes, uh, once I was asked, how would John Marshall have decided Dred Scott and Plessy against Ferguson? No one knows, but if you let me be an advocate for a moment, not a judge, I would say, uh, look at a case that John Marshall decided and uh, wrote an opinion on in, uh, I think about 18, 20 or thereabouts. Uh, a group of Negro slaves were being sent up the Mississippi River on a steamboat. And I don't recall now in the case whether some of them were killed or only injured. But the legal question came, uh, is the liability on damage measured uh, by uh, the rule of freight or the rule of passengers? And we know the difference in that rule is very marked. And Marshall, in one short paragraph, said, of course, the rule of passengers. Uh, these uh, people were not freight. Uh, these are human beings uh, made by our common creator. And uh, now that's only a glancing suggestion. But I think from that, I would argue that John Marshall would have decided Dred Scott the other way and Plessy against the, the other way. And the history of our country, in terms of the great racial problems, uh, would have been very different, and maybe there wouldn't have been a civil war to try to settle it.
that's speculation. No, remember, this is an advocate, not a judge <laughs> speaking. Uh, but from error to correction and error to correction, we've got a pretty good record in the United States. Thank you. Mr. Chief Judge, I didn't want to cut off any students particularly from questions, but I have you asked three times if there's any questions, and hinting by saying you know it all already, uh, I thought no one had one. So if anyone does, we've got another minute or two. We're running a little late, but that's all right. Any student have a question? Professor Shai, you're a great student of the Constitution, but I'm talking about current students. Yes. I was just wondering if you could comment on there's a lot of talk now about uh, debating the terms of senators and Congress. Talk about how that limiting the terms of so they get an over. Yeah. The question is uh, would Chief Justice comment on the proposals flying about to limit the terms of congressmen and senators? Well, I might say off the record, there are some of them I'd like to limit. <laughs> But I'd be very careful, I'd be very careful about putting limits. It has some advantages in some respects. I think it was a mistake to put a two-term limit on the president. Uh, I would have, if I was doing it all alone, said, uh, let it rest with the tradition established by George Washington, followed by Thomas Jefferson, followed by James Madison. Uh, I think, as I said with reference to the flag burning case, uh, I, I let well enough alone, even though I repeat, there are some of them I'd, I'd like to limit permanently. <laughs> Any other student? Yes, ma'am. How do you feel about Scott's sentence? Do you feel that Meyer Ford should be away on it? I heard the first part. How do you feel about sorry decisis? Do you feel that modern courts are chipping away at the Our modern courts chipping away at the doctrine of sorry decisis. Well, one answer to that is I'm glad they chipped away from that sorry decisis after the Dred Scott opinion and after the Plessy against Ferguson opinion. Certainly, uh, there, there must be a consistency but not a consistency uh, uh, of absolutes. Uh, otherwise, we'd still have Dred Scott and Plessy against Ferguson and a number of other very bad decisions uh, uh, binding us. Uh, my own view was, and both on the Court of Appeals and on the Supreme Court was, unless there's a very, very strong reason uh, we should follow. No, we did not. I wrote five opinions in one cluster. They're sometimes called the Miller against California group on uh, pornography and obscenity in 1973, I think it was. Uh, we modified the prior opinions, but I th thought, and a majority of the court thought, that the time had come. Uh, the earlier opinions had said that pornography and obscenity must be judged uh, on the basis of a national standard. Uh, there is no national standard of what is uh, pornography or what is obscenity. And uh, you, you remember it's, uh, uh, Justice Stewart was frequently quoted and he was quoting someone else that he knew it when he saw it, but he couldn't define it. Uh, that isn't a very good legal standard because then that means you're going to have uh, uh, in individual judgments. Uh, I thought it was time, and in the opinion, there is a statement that the people, I've forgotten which cities, so don't hold me to the cities, the people of um, New Hampshire don't have to be bound by what uh, is found acceptable in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, each community uh, should make the standard. And that has, it has not stopped pornography, but it has uh, curtailed it a great deal in this country. Uh, where it hasn't stopped it is that uh, uh, prosecution authorities have not been diligent to uh, apply that rule. Again, just to sum it up, I think we should follow prior authority unless there's a very, very good reason not to. Every good thing has to come to an end. And one of the sad parts of my job is to announce it when we get there.
Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. We can never be as fully expressive of our appreciation. Uh, I hope to have you back again every year for many, many years to come. Thank you.